In my time at Harvard, and before that as a practicing urban planner, I've been interested in how economic and technological transformations affect the form and function of cities. For the last five years, I've been exploring these issues in the Philippines, and I want to take you on a journey there today. I first visited the Philippines in 2013 on a research trip to study housing in Manila. After nearly 22 hours of flying from Boston, I arrived jet-lagged, really, really jet-lagged, and I went to bed in the late afternoon. I woke up the following morning at 2 a.m. It was a Wednesday, and I was wide awake. Rather than lie in bed and try to fall back asleep or count sheep, I decided to go out for a walk. Now, naturally, I was expecting the city to be quiet and deserted. For a moment, I wondered if it might be unsafe to go out at such an early hour. But what I encountered when I left the hotel was something completely unexpected. As you can see, the city was bustling at 2 a.m. There were people out talking with their friends and eating at street-side cafes. There weren't just adults, but children too, entire families. There was a market that was open throughout the early morning hours. And at 4 a.m. and 5 a.m., the line at Starbucks and Jollibee and McDonald's was out the door. There was a traffic jam in front of my hotel at 4 a.m. And I even came across a sign for Applebee's advertising not one, but two happy hours, one at seven at night and the other at six in the morning. Imagine that, boneless buffalo wings and frozen margaritas at six in the morning. I was perplexed when I left the hotel. I had no idea what was going on. For a second, I thought maybe I set my watch incorrectly after landing. It felt more like seven or eight at night. So I went up to a group of people eating outside and asked them for the time. 2 a.m. My watch was correct. I turned back to them. I was really confused. I said, excuse me, but why are so many people eating dinner at 2 a.m.? Is it a holiday? Did a concert get out? What, what's going on? And they all laughed, turned back to me, and said, we're not having dinner. We're having lunch. We're on our lunch break. We work on American time. That's our office up there. And they pointed to this building, which at the top had the very familiar logo of Dell Computers. And that's when everything started to click. I have a question for the audience. Who here has placed a phone call to a bank, an airline, a computer manufacturer like Dell, and suspected that the person on the other end of the line was in another country? <laughs> OK, almost everybody. Can't see all of you. Uh, this is a pretty common experience if you live in the United States, if you live in Australia, Europe, Canada. This practice is called business process outsourcing, or BPO and customer service call centers are one subsector of this industry. It just so happened that I had booked a hotel room in an area called Eastwood City, which is one of the largest hubs for the call center industry. The Philippines is 12 hours ahead of Eastern Standard Time in the United States, and the US is by far the largest market served in the Philippines outsourcing industry. The most common work shift is from nine at night to six in the morning. And for this reason, areas like Eastwood City and dozens of other development projects that cater to the outsourcing sector function primarily at night. They're most active at night. The Philippines has replaced India as the call center capital of the world. 25 years ago, it was expensive and rather unreliable to route a significant volume of calls from the United States to the Philippines. Today, this is the fastest growing industry in the Philippines. It accounts for over $23 billion in revenue annually and has brought over a million jobs to the country. In contrast to other scholars who have looked at the growth of this industry from an economic or an anthropological perspective, I'm interested in how the outsourcing industry is changing cities and city planning practice. For the last few years, I've been mapping the geographic distribution of call centers and their temporal and infrastructural asymmetries. I've been interviewing politicians, business executives, urban planners, and of course, call center agents. And I've been mapping the growth dynamics of call center industries. What I'm finding is striking, and I want to share a few takeaways with you today. The first involves the construction of new office space. Over the last few years, hundreds of thousands of square feet of new office space have been constructed across the Philippines, catering primarily to the BPO industry. You see, it's very difficult to open a call center in an existing office building. One of the most important requirements is a large floor plate on which hundreds, if not over 1,000 employees, can be assembled on a single floor. 
This example of a typical floor plan gives you a sense of the density in the arrangement of employees. In many cases, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to convert this office building to other uses, to traditional office uses. Now, these call centers are typically located in special economic zones known as IT centers, and they receive a variety of tax incentives in doing so. What's interesting about these IT centers is that they tend to be located in central urban areas and adjacent to a variety of other uses. This, for example, is the Venetian Grand Canal project in the city of Taguig in Metro Manila. It includes a large shopping mall and restaurants. There's even a canal through the property where you can ride a gondola. There's a condominium, a hotel, a vocational school, and call centers, dozens of call centers that anchor the project but are not the only aspect of the project. The growth of the industry is also creating unusual challenges for public transportation. In particular, how do hundreds of thousands of people commute to and from work outside of normal business hours? I've been mapping the changes to formal and informal transportation networks, and I've also been surveying people who work on a night shift. I found that people working in the BPO industry typically spend between three and four hours in traffic every single day. And security is also a concern. In one city I visited, the mayor told me that with 50,000 people working at night in his city in call centers, there's been an increase in crime. The city has responded by installing thousands of streetlights around urban areas and by changing the shift of the police force. And they're still grappling with this issue and searching for solutions. And although these call centers are typically located in large private corporate estates, their characteristics also seep into the adjacent urban areas. The local barangays. These uh, images are from the barangays of South Sembo and Bagumbayan, where many long-term residents are beginning to change their sleep schedule, business owners are operating more in the evening, and many call center agents and people working in the BPO industry, tired of their long commutes, are looking for housing in bed space. What's happening in the Philippines today is one example of the local implications of global capitalism and global outsourcing. It's also an example of how new technologies, in this case, cheap digital communications around the world, have unintended consequences on the form of cities and social practices within cities. In the case of the Philippines, entire urban areas synchronized to a foreign time zone, often to our time zone, in, in the process, disrupting the cultural rhythm of the nation. As these maps demonstrate, Offices that service particular time zones tend to co-locate near one another. They cluster in particular parts of the city. I refer to this in my writing as the temporal logic of agglomeration. I'd like to conclude, however, on a more speculative note, one about how we design cities today. Nobody knows how long Dell Computers or any other corporation will be routing customer service calls from the United States to the Philippines. However, many analysts suggest that in just the next few years, a significant number of these jobs will be, re will be replaced by artificial intelligence and voice automated technology. This is particularly concerning considering the number of people working in the industry and also considering the extent to which urban environments are being restructured to accommodate this industry's growth. The key question then, which I address in my dissertation, is how do we imagine a kind of urban planning that is responsive to more than just one economic cycle? a kind of planning that is adaptive and resilient to the ever-increasing pace of economic and technological transformation around the world today. Thank you.